thank everybody for taking the time to join the session. And as is customary, we'll quickly cover the presentation side, assuming that you've gone through it or had a personal glance at it, and obviously spend as much time as possible on the presentation. Having the safe harbor statement, you're well aware of nothing new there. Uh, just again, a reminder to everybody that the way the numbers are being presented is consolidated view downwards into uh, TM Tata branded commercial vehicles anywhere in the world, Tata passenger, Tata branded passenger vehicles anywhere in the world, Jaguar Land Rover vehicle financing. That's all the verticals are done. No change in that. Just a reminder. Next one. Again, it's been a another intense period uh, for us, uh, both in TML and in JLR. And uh, for us, that we have fallout, I would want to make is in terms of uh, the incorporation of smart mobility solutions uh, uh, subsidiary for managing the uh, GCC business of the government of India and the state transport undertaking. And of course, the EV portfolio continues to expand with the launch of EV, uh, next one EV Prime. And JR for the Defender 130 launch, we'll talk about later as it comes through uh, this quarter. And we focus continues to deliver uh, results for us. And the order bank grows to a new record of 200,000 units. Next slide, please. On the financial, let me start by uh, putting it in context in the quarter. Yes, there is a fair amount of challenges on semiconductors and COVID related lockdown that we had to contend with. Uh, but at the same time, the one that really caused us grief was the ramp up, uh, the slower than expected ramp up that we had in Range Rover and Range Rover Sport. And I'm sure Theory and Adrian are going to talk about it in the, in the coming plan. But uh, as we end the quarter and we enter into Q2, uh, we believe we are in a strong wicket and therefore uh, are quite confident of how the current quarter is going to land up that is Q2. But that's for the future. But let's quickly delve into Q1. Uh, growth of 48% in both sales and about 8% revenue growth. And the pre-VT before exceptional item of about uh, 1,500 crores in uh, JLR on pension related matters, which Adrian will talk about, uh, is a 5,000 crore loss. EBITDA uh, deteriorated by about 90 loops year on year, and EBIT percentages uh, and EBIT percentages of about 60 bips uh, improvement compared to last year. Same time is something that uh, could have been better. And FCF on a uh, outflow basis about 9,800 crores. Most of it is working capital, so not particularly worried about it. Next slide. Obviously, the numbers also got impacted by the revaluation of FX and commodity hedges in the highly volatile. Uh, FX and commodity markets. Next slide. Source of growth, if you look at it, the market, we grew about 8% in revenue terms, volume and price uh, contributing roughly 50 50, and translation took away a lot of it. This is basically pound sterling uh, depreciating a lot, vis a vis Indian rupee, and therefore that's what you see as a 4.3% in the translation. And the profitability improvement, uh, most of the cylinders fired. Uh, between CV, PV, and the others, and of course JLR took down their bit profitability because of their challenges that they had, which I'm sure will turn around in this quarter. Net automotive debt uh, went up from 48,700 to about 60,700 crores, uh, almost entirely explained by working capital and about 2,000 crores of uh, underlying uh, external debt that is there to 34,800. But that should reverse once the profitability improves. With this, let me now hand it over to Adrian to take you in JLR in, in a bit of detail. Adrian? Yeah, many thanks, Balaji. Next slide, please. OK, so this is a six, six quadrant. Uh, as Balaji said, disappointing quarter for us in Q1. Retails were balanced the same. Um, you know, so as you'll see in the presentation, we have no concerns about demand and retail levels at all. Revenue was down, uh, wholesale volumes were down 7% and that's reflected in the revenue, but particularly because of the model changeover. Main plates Range Rover and Range Rover Sport in the quarter. We had a particularly weak mix within that revenue base and that really is the story for the losses that you see there, the 500 million, the EBITDA 6%, and the EBIT minus 4% in the quarter. Free cash flow was minus 769. Uh, that's not a number we're proud of, although it is the best quarter one result for five years, incredibly. But we can do much, much better with that uh, in Q2 and going forwards. We're certain of that. Next slide. OK, so these are the key performance highlights. I've mentioned some of them. 
or the bank's balance you mentioned up to 200,000 units. We will take you through that. Um, there is a pensions benefit for the re-establishment of our future pension liabilities at an inflation level of CPI rather than RPI. That's excluded from that loss uh, before tax because it's uh, it's non EBIT related. A refocus program continues to go well. I will take you through that. And the liquidity continues to be strong. 3.7 billion cash on hand and a 1.5 billion revolving credit facility from July 2022. So total liquidity 5 billion plus. Next slide, please. OK, so this is our retails and our wholesales in quarter one by brand. We've broken this out by the we used to re refer this to nameplate families. We're now referencing this as individual brands. Uh, retails at the top there, you see a flat and they're pretty much flat across all of the brands. Obviously, that's retails are being fed from dealer inventory. I do have an inventory slide later. And there's some things on there that hopefully you'll see as this starting to turn around for us. Wholesales, this really lands on the point about our Range Rover and our Range Rover Sport. You can see there in the Range Rover brand, uh, wholesales are the lowest quarter over quarter and versus last year. That's where we've fallen because we haven't been able to build up the production in that new facility. I'll talk to that later as well as fast as we would have wished. And that's really the story behind the total wholesale reduction in the quarter. Defender was stronger than previous quarters in last year as uh, that plant in Nitra is getting closer to a level of production than any other plant at the moment. Next slide, please. And this is the same date, but hit now broken down by uh, region, regional sales, retails again at the top. And what you see here, which, you know, knowing our profile of what we sell where is corroboratory to the last page. You know, we've done weakest in our regions that are most reliant on our Range Rover and our Range Rover Sport because of our inability to ramp those products up at the speed we would have wished. So North America is down significantly heavy Range Rover, Range Rover Sport region. So is China down heavy Range Rover, Range Rover Sport region and also snippets of overseas. We've done better actually in the quarter in the regions that take the other products from other plants, i.e. SUV 2 and 3 in Europe and the UK. And the wholesale data you see there as well, I won't go through that all in detail. It's a version of what I've said before. You see China down again because of that Range Rover, Range Rover Sport number set. Electrified data up 2% on previous quarter now to 66%. The BEV and the PHEV data is down slightly, and that's because of the absence of the Range Rover, Range Rover Sport for PHEVs also. Next slide, please. OK, so this is our walk from last quarter, uh, sorry, from quarter one last year. And it's telling you what you should expect to see. The significant adverse is on both volumes down 13,000 units and mix within that mix. There's actually a negative of 170 for Range Rover, Range Rover Sport and 50 positive for Defender. <coughs> Our VME continues to be at historical lows and the pricing actions we took earlier in the year are starting to come through. Inflationary pressures are similar to what we actually indicated in Q4. <coughs> we continue to have bad news on capitalized engineering. Why? Because our new programs haven't yet come to maturation. We expect that to change as we go through the balance of this year. That's worth about a point and a half a bit next. And then the, uh, the bad news on revaluation because sterling fell to 121 at the end of the quarter. The bad news on commodities because actually commodity uh, rates for aluminium and palladium, the ones we hedge most, actually also fell as we went through the quarter. Obviously, both of those two things are good news for our operating model. And you can see operational uh, financial exchange, particularly on the dollar, was good news in the quarter. So overall, that walked us from the minus 0.9% uh, EBIT to the minus 4.4% EBIT. And again, this excludes the uh, pension exceptional item, which I referenced earlier. Next slide, please. The next quarter 
then that will start to lift to a normal level I've given you before 50 to 60 percent, and that's worth a point and a half percent even. Capital investment is lower. This time last year, we we're finishing off our investments and our Sully or facility for MLA. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay. And again. So let's talk about uh, where we were on supply and particularly on production in the quarter. I'll give you a second to start reading that, but I hit the highlights. So look, we did have some chip uh, supply constraints, particularly earlier in the quarter, but particularly, you know, relevant to the build out of our old Range Rover Sport. That did delay the completion of the old Range Rover Sport. Many of those units we did actually need to build into WIP, which we're clearing through, actually some of them this month in July. That did have an impact on the transfer of our labor into the new facility which builds the new Range Rover and the Range Rover Sport. So there was an impact on semiconductors. It was a particular supplier. And the work we've done with that particular supplier later in the quarter has meant we haven't had any further disturbance from that supply source right through to the shutdown period at the end of July. So it shows the long term contract work we are doing is actually starting to show benefits. We are seeing the light at the end of this very, very long tunnel here, particularly on semiconductors, we feel. And then the rest has been all about our ability to ramp up uh, two new vehicles on an all new architecture in an all new trim and final facility with an all new body shop. And of course, you know, a, a workforce that needs training and an added shift, by the way, we have added a third shift into that facility because of the huge demand that we have for these products within our order bags. And it's, so those challenges are actually quite normal for a changeover point, but they have been exacerbated by the semiconductor point I mentioned earlier, and also the COVID lockdowns in China, which did impact the ability for us to consistently build units, you know, week by week within that facility. A lot of that is starting now to become behind us. I've mentioned the partnership agreement with that key supplier, which has meant no shortages of semiconductors from that source for the rest of the quarter and through the first three weeks of July. Our ramp up is beginning, particularly on the Range Rover, which was the first vehicle, and our production on that vehicle doubled as we went through the quarter from just about 500 units a week to just over a thousand units a week. So we're starting to see that increase ramp up speed on the Range Rover through to July that increased again to about 1300 a week. So we really do feel we're breaking through on the Range Rover and we now will go into that same process with the new Range Rover Sport, which may take a couple of months or so. And we're also seeing reduced impact from COVID lockdowns in China as well. So just the point around MLA, the production of the new Range Rover, the production of the new Range Rover Sport, the improvements we've made over the last six weeks, where we ended up in July in a much better place in April. You now, with what we see in front of us, you know, we're now starting to see the capability to deliver 90,000 units to our dealers and importers in quarter two. So a significant jump from that quarter one. Next slide, please. And the orders have kept growing. In fact, they've grown in this quarter larger than any other quarter, marginally larger than the quarter when we announced and showed the Range Rover in October last year. We now have got 200,000 customer orders. That excludes the dealer orders, of course. Uh, and you can see there our three latest and greatest uh, product offerings, Range Rover, the Range Rover Sport at the bottom there, and the Defender making up almost 65% of that volume. Uh, they are our most valuable brands and most valuable nameplates as well. So we have a super healthy order bank, a super, super healthy future revenue stream, and we're starting to break through the production issues. And they're starting to be light at the end of a very long tunnel on supply and semiconductors as well. So a lot of that is not reflected in Q1. That's why we're really disappointed. And as you can probably hear from my voice, 
a tad frustrated about quarter one as well. But we are starting to see those core ingredients move in our favour into quarter two. Next slide, please. And we've also the re revealed you know, a new member of our Defender brand family, the Defender 130, the extension of the vehicle at the rear, beyond the rear wheels. Uh, this vehicle will safely uh, and comfortably occupy eight adults. We expect it to be very, very popular in our US and some Middle Eastern markets as well. And if you did notice, even though the production at Nitra is closest to a normal level than any of the plant, our demand in orders for Defender increased by five, six thousand units in the quarter. A lot of that was for this vehicle. So it's had an incredibly fast start and appeal, even though it was only revealed a month before the end of uh, the quarter. Next slide, please. OK, refocus. Look, we did one and a half billion last year, even though it was a very thin transactional value quarter for us, we still did 250 million in quarter one. That was broken down in three constituents. You've seen most of that data already earlier in the presentation. The net pricing uh, value was 120 million. That's a big constituent of it. We are starting to see labour and efficiency benefits within our agile transformation, particularly within the engineering fraternity. Obviously, we're doing that mostly to ensure that we speed up the quality maturation and the delivery of our products. But of course, you know, the unspoken within there is the cost of delivering them uh, will be lower. Also spending less time and less uh, uh, less people hours on it. And then the investment number, which was low for the quarter, and therefore did contribute in this quarter. But I do expect that to, to uh, be much, much less in later quarters. And I expect the other constituents to be greater. Next slide, please. So inflation, we'll be talking about inflation, I'm certain for the next few quarters. Now we introduced this slide earlier this year. It's the same slide on the left, 12 and a half billion cost base, variable cost base, four significant elements within there, which are which are uh, suspect to high inflation levels, labor, commodity costs, semiconductor conductor prices, and energy, of course. And you know, the, the balance between the pressures have shifted a little bit. We went into the quarter with aluminium at three and a half thousand dollars a ton. We've come out the quarter with two thousand four hundred dollars. Palladium came down as well, three hundred dollars. So it shifted a little bit temporarily, perhaps from commodities. But of course, we're getting some utility energy cost increases, semiconductor cost increases and labor cost increases. So the absolute number for the quarter versus last year was 160 million pounds greater. It's a little bit less than I was expecting actually in the quarter. I was expecting up to 200 million. You know, and some of these headwinds are stronger and some of them are starting to alleviate. But I think it's reasonable to assume we will have quarter over quarter data of this type of scale and size as we go through at least the next two quarters. Not certain about uh, where we end up in Q4 yet. And our refocus program, we're very, very confident, will more than offset and almost did. Well, in fact, it did offset, even though not fully in EBIT, uh, you know, the on cost in inflation as we go through FY23. So I'll repeat two or three things here. One is we're very confident about the overall scale of the program. And what we will do this year, we're confident that it will offset in total the absolute amount of inflation. And as we go into the second half of the year, we expect an EBIT offset also, as most of the uh, inflationary pressure we're seeing is then overtaken by the other things that we are doing, including the pricing actions, which will come through later in the year. Next slide, please. This is an important slide, although it doesn't look it. Right, so this is the health of our end to end pipeline from build to ship in those vehicles. And if you, I take you back to January 21, we've taught this two or three times before, but I wanted to talk specifically today. If I take you back to January 21, that's as close to a normal, healthy pre semiconductor pipeline that we have. And it, it increases and falls down because of the aberration called March 
in the UK where we build units and then we sell them. So if you draw a line versus the first three months, you'll see pretty much 60,000 units in the dealer pipeline and 40,000 units in our pipeline. I under thousand total units would have been a pre semiconductor normal environment. And from there, our order bank is about twice of our de uh, dealer dealer inventory. That's what we would have expected before semiconductors. Whips about 4,000 units. That's what that blue line lived. The whip is a subset of the gray line called GLR inventory. We own the WIP, we own the JNR infantry. That's on our balance sheet. That's a part of the three billion pounds that you would have seen if you look at the balance sheet. It really, really fell as we went through our quarter two. You will remember the quarter two. They both fell towards the 30,000 level from a, a, an inventory a dealer and an inventory at GLR perspective. But our WIP also fell to about 2,000 units. Right, so we were building cars, but very, very few. We've gradually grown both of these over the course of the next uh, last three quarters, excuse me, through to June. And there's been a significant uptick, as you can see there in June. So what that means, we are releasing more cars into the uh, into the dealer network, and we are releasing more cars onto transporters, onto trains and onto ships, and they will turn into retails and wholesales at some point. And we do believe a part of that uplift is going to happen in quarter two. Now, we did end up with 10,000 cars in work in progress at the end of June. 5,000 of those were Range Rovers and Range Rover Sport. And I'm simply giving you more corroboratory evidence to the real breakthrough here is in that facility at Solihull, Range Rover, Range Rover Sports. That should have been 1,000, not 5,000. And we're starting to work that number down, including during our shutdown period this week and next week. And we have high confidence those units will also be released onto those uh, transporters, ships and trains as we go through August and into September. So we are a long, long way away from being normal here. But this is evidence that it's starting to shift back towards a more normal environment, which underpins our 90,000 unit projection for Q2. Next slide, please. So one of the things that are in front of us, uh, I've said them a few times already, right? We absolutely need to continue to make progress in our new facility at Solihull. We're very, very confident we're doing that on Range Rover. We can then repeat that product off the same architecture, don't forget, in Range Rover Sport later in quarter two. Our guidance is circa the 90,000 units that I've mentioned a number of times. We're very confident refocus will be a billion pounds, and there is a plus there, by the way. I'll be more informative about how much of a plus when we talk in November. Uh, our four year guidance is still 5% and 1 billion positive cash flow, despite the disappointing and frustrating quarter one. That does mean we need to break through in quarter two and delivering 90,000 units would be a sufficient breakthrough to underpin that number. And we will then need to break through again in quarter three. And that's where the Range Rover Sport will come through strongly for us, we do believe. Our longer term targets, of course, on reimagine. We rarely talk about these, right? Please don't think because we're not talking about them. We're not doing them. We absolutely are doing them. 90% of our engineering teams are on reimagine programs now and those engineers were released from Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, which is why the capitalization is so low at the moment. So overwhelmingly, the focus and attention of our workforce is on future product. We now have a much more concentrated, determined, full time response to the daily activity, which you're starting to see us break through on. And that has been added to again during quarter one because of the challenges we had in quarter one. Free cash flow, look, I'm not walking away from the near near debt number in FY24. We have to break through in quarter two. We are running out of time. We just have 21 months. And that means from the end of June, that's an average 200 million positive cash each month. This is still possible, but we need to break through with speed. And you know, the confidence when we do break through will underpin FY24, 7% plus uh, EBIT. And obviously at that point, we'll be in a really nice place to talk to you about how we're going to walk to 10% plus. 
Next slide, please. That's me, Balaji. To the, to the numbers here, on the market share side, we had uh, we clocked a 42.5% for the quarter, and the key call out here is the shift away. And more than a shift away, the more a shift towards the demand pool supply chain to ensure that the sustainable the market share gains are sustainable <coughs> and focusing squarely on how we are working with the registration market shares rather than wholesale led market shares. So this is something that uh, we are committed to, and therefore this noise in terms of market shares for a quarter or two will be there, but it will then get us into a more sustainable pathway of simultaneous market share gains optimal inventories at the leaders, and of course, uh, lower levels of VMEs that we need to put in place. So that's the emphasis there. I'm sure Giri should want to talk about it subsequently. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the key call out in this slide is a, is a mix of you see of powertrains. Uh, we would want to watch the ILCV space carefully because we did notice uh, the reduction in the CNG composition. Believe it is nice, temporary nice, as the prices of CNG versus diesel arbitrage came down a bit. But let's watch it for a few more quarters before we can take any uh, message out of it. Next slide. Overall numbers, uh, CV turned in a, a positive PBT for the quarter, and uh, on a uh, year-on-year -year basis, revenue grew 107%. But obviously, this being a weaker quarter, you did see a sequential drop in terms of revenues. And uh, EBITDA at about five and a half percent and an EBIT of 2.8 percent. We expect this is something that's now starting to stabilize and we'll be able to build from here on as the commodities come off. So that is the thing on CV going forward. In terms of uh, the walk, the PNL walk, you'll notice that uh, we are stepping up uh, FME in line with uh, our plan to move to a more full base supply chain. So therefore, working on retail leads. And uh, employee cost of 203 crores basically just uh, uh, the beginning of the year when the, when the numbers reset bonuses for the year, etc. And uh, what you see is from unrealized FX and commodity hedges. Uh, we did lose on the rupee depreciation because the hedges uh, on, on the exports did lose money. And this would then get compensated by the dividend income coming in from product coming. So overall, that piece is uh, the, the numbers balance each other out. But the other call out I would definitely say is look at the line between realizations uh, versus variable cost. This number, if you recollect, used to be at 540 bips. So most of the pricing actions have gone through realizations to offset the commodity costs have gone through. And therefore, we should start seeing this starting to improve here. Next slide. Grish. Yeah. Thanks, Balaji. Uh, so some of the highlights for the quarter. I think the industry continued uh, good recovery and doubled the volume over the Q1 of last year. Of course, the last Q1 was marred by the pandemic, second wave. But uh, nevertheless, I think good growth shown in Q1. Uh, the bit margin improved by 690 bits, driven by the revenue growth, as also the pricing and cost actions that we've taken. And has also grown 240 basis points over FY22 full year. Uh, we continue to see a very good growth in our spares and service penetration, thereby improving the non vehicle business revenue by 75% over Q1 of last year. And this is, of course, a good profitable uh, stream for us. Uh, on new products, we continue uh, to launch. Uh, 15 new products were launched along with 25 variants. And as all of you know, we also launched the uh, ACE electric vehicle in the quarter gone by. Uh, some of the bright spots, and we've seen that the trucker sentiment index, which we track every quarter, is now almost at a two year high in uh, MNSCVs and intermediate and light commercial vehicles. Of course, this survey was done just before the first uh, interest rate hike was announced. So we are keeping a track of this. There has been some softening of the sentiment after that, but I think overall it remains very, very positive. Uh, on the commodity side, uh, did show some hardening up during the beginning of the quarter, but towards the end, I think we are seeing signs of softening after uh, a good upward run since second half of last year. Coming to the passenger segment, finally we are seeing uh, return of demand. So with the staff movement 
uh, that is employee transportation to offices and factories back in place as also tours and travel and um, specifically opening of schools has led to good demand and the volumes grew by 60 percent over two four of uh, last year which is just the quarter gone by and almost four four times that of what we had seen in the first quarter of last year so very good uh, demand coming back although this is still lower than the highs which were achieved in FY19. Uh, Balaji spoke about uh, the retail push uh, that we have uh, initiated and uh, happy to tell you that we had the highest retails uh, in small commercial vehicle and pickup in Q1 of any year for almost last 10 years. Uh, going ahead, some of the focus areas, I think our international uh, markets demand has been impacted especially in SARC as well as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, essentially due to steep depreciation in the local currency, uh, along with fuel price take high. And of course, Sri Lanka, all of us know about the political turmoil. Uh, in, this, in these circumstances, we are looking at uh, alternate markets and products to see how we can get back to uh, the required level of volumes for international business. I uh, spoke about the retail acceleration and a lot of demand pull uh, to ensure that uh, we actually have sustainable gains going ahead, sustainable share gains. So there's a lot of push on the digital lead generation and happy to tell you that 20% uh, of our volumes are now coming from leads coming from digital in, in small commercial vehicle and pickup. Uh, with the interest rates increasing, I think we have continued our engagement with the key financiers and trying to find out uh, ways and means to see how we can support the customers in this environment. Uh, we started the margin improvement journey towards the second half of last year. We continue to do that and has is being driven by both pricing actions as well as the cost savings and the fundamental margin has improved quarter on quarter from Q4 to Q1. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Update on the new businesses uh, on electric mobility. Happy to inform you that additionally 100 electric buses were delivered in, uh, in Q1. So now we have cumulative 715 electric buses running on Indian roads and cumulative coverage of more than 40 million kilometers. So that's a good experience that we have and over multiple cities uh, in the country. Uh, we are also working on the fuel cell electric bus as we've been mentioning and the program is on track and in fact we had first milestone review with IOCL with whom we are working jointly and this milestone has been completed successfully and both the partners were quite happy with the progress. Uh, we did foray into the last mile e-mobility on cargo side with the launch of uh, ACV. And we have more and more understanding for now 39,000 units. We already started uh, customer trials and towards the end of this quarter, we will also start delivery of uh, products. Uh, going ahead, we also incorporated the TNL Smart City Mobilization Solutions Limited as a subsidiary and operationalized 53 buses in Delhi. Uh, Delhi Transport Corporation and as a part of the smart city mobility solutions, which is the gross cost contract model or own and operate model, we are now managing 450 buses, more than 450 buses and delivering more than 96% uptime. And all of you know, we were declared L1 for the largest global tender of more than 5,000 e buses. And now we have received uh, LOA, that is letter of allocation from Delhi Transport Corporation amongst these uh, 5,000 buses for around 1,500. We are engaging with the rest of the cities and their transport undertakings with LOAs for uh, their share as well. As an outcome, the revenue which this business has generated in quarter one is around 145 crores and we are on track uh, in terms of the revenue revenue trajectory. On the digital businesses, fleet edge, we are focusing on uh, increasing adoption and active usage. So we have more than 235,000 vehicles now, uh, amounting to around 100,000 customers who are already on onboarded. 
we are now initiating the minimum minimum viable product two of our retail is already being uh, piloted with few customers. It will be launched in next month. This will enhance the user uh, user experience further. So this is based on the experience uh, expectations that we have captured from the customers. And finally, our digital storefront for spare parts uh, called as Eduqan is doing pretty well. Continues to grow. And has grown 26% uh, in revenue over quarter four of last year. So that's in summary of uh, about the new businesses. Back to you, Balaji. Thank you, Girish. Uh, just moving on to the passenger vehicle business. Uh, uh, call out on this slide is fundamentally around the powertrain mix. Uh, what's the CNG numbers now? We're increasing to 11%. Uh, EVs continue to grow strong at 7%. Next slide. And market share of course of 14.3 percent, and the EV market share continues strong at 88 percent. Next slide. And uh, from an overall financials perspective, uh, we continue to do well on the improvements in profitability that we are putting through. So the business is now on a PBT break even after a long time, and uh, EBITDA 200 bits and EBIT margins of 750 bits then going strong and likely to improve further. Obviously, for the on a year on year basis, one of the things to watch out for is the sequential uh, FME facing IPL came in in this quarter. That's a bit of a phasing issue that impacted sequential margins, but that's something that should take care of itself. Next slide. On a, a overall uh, financials, both volume mix and realization is coming through strong. Still about 30 odd bips of uh, variable cost versus realization to be made up as we go forward. Stepped up FME strong and is likely to step up even further as we go forward. And uh, overall, uh, commo commodity hedges did cause a bit of grief, and that's flowing through the PNL uh, that you see there. Next slide. Uh, Shalish. Thank you, Balaji. So let me start with uh, the Q1 industry highlights. So in Q1, the industry wholesale increased by 41 percent year on year as the semiconductor supplies improved, uh, and uh, in the quarter sales were quite healthy at nine lakh in the quarter. Segmental shift towards SUV further strengthened. Uh, it was at 40%. We had just continued to lose each other's share from 37% to 34% so the last year. As far as Tata uh, Motors is concerned, we continue to strengthen our market share and uh, we have maintained the spend of your quarter on quarter growth in market share. Uh, and uh, while the PV ICE business grew by 103%, uh, the EV business grew by nearly five times. Uh, the wholesale and production milestones, you know, we crossed the milestone of 133. And last uh, month of the quarter, we also crossed uh, one of the major milestones of uh, a monthly sale of 45,000. Uh, as far as EVs are concerned, we posted the highest of uh, EV sales of 9,300 units. This, this was despite the stress that we faced on semiconductors uh, in the first half of the quarter. And the market share remains strong at 88 percent. Uh, last several months now, we continue to be the number one SUV manufacturer. Uh, and it was the case in Q1 at 523. Next one has been trending at the number one CV in my five or the six uh, SUVs that we have in the market. Uh, to further strengthen our supply side, we uh, uh, signed a tripartite MOU in government of Gujarat, Ford, and Tata Motors. For a potential acquisition of the Ford Sami Bank. being discussed, and uh, very soon we will be uh, uh, meaning that is going to be uh, Going forward, as far as industry is concerned, we clearly see that uh, for this financial year, industry will grow to nearly three and a half million. EV demand is going to continue to remain strong uh, with. Uh, Continued positive word of mouth of uh, nearly 40,000 uh, EV customers that we have today. Uh, as far as Tata Motors is concerned, our, at the start of the Q2, we have a very robust booking pipeline and low channel inventory, which uh, poses well for quarter two. Uh, demand for SUVs remains strong. We have a very strong booking pipeline here also. Uh, there has been a good traction of CNG, which continues. Uh, we expect the vehicle supply to improve with better semiconductor availability in the property. Uh, rural demand is expected to be uh, strong on the back of good monsoon. And next one, we need maths, which we launched in May, uh, 
has seen a tremendous uh, response and has augmented the EV demand. Um, and supplies are expected to increase in quarter three. But going forward, the challenges we really see is that the high inflation and interest rate may start impacting the auto demand. Uh, while there's no stress as far as people is concerned, uh, until the festive season, we don't see a concern, or, or don't, we, we also don't see a sign as far as the uh, dampening of demand is concerned. But given how the retail industry is getting impacted because of these factors, we have to be a bit watchful. Uh, and uh, post the uh, festive season, it will be a litmus test of how the industry demand sustains. Uh, as far as Tata Motors is concerned, we will remain focused on demand generation activities. Uh, with the now uh, segment level and micro market level focus. We continue to enhance the supplies further with uh, uh, as the semiconductor availability also engage and we'll fast track the cost reduction effort to track the biology. Thank you, Shalish. Uh, moving quickly on to uh, the cash flow slides already there. Let's get that go straight into the Tata uh, Motors finance. Go to the next one. Yeah, so here call outs here, uh, collection efficiency starting to improve now at 98% for June, and therefore GNPA will, will keep uh, improving with every passing quarter and uh, fully compliant with all the new PCA norms that RBI has put in place, and both capital adequacy and liquidity remains comfortable. And the aspiration is to take that ROE from 5.1% all the way up to double digits in the, in the foreseeable future. Next slide. So coming on to the outlook, uh, key callouts, uh, demand remains strong and we expect it to remain strong despite inflation and geopolitical situation. Obviously, we need to watch the Indian CV situation carefully, but uh, right now we don't see any cost for concern at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Chip supply is expected to improve further from Q2 and therefore cooling and added with the cooling commodity prices that should also help in underlying margin. And therefore we do aim to deliver the strong improvement in EBIT and free cash flows from Q2 onwards. And one of the key things in this is what Adrian talked extensively about is uh, JLR delivering on 90K and on this side, uh, continuing to improve market shares while restoring double digit EBITDA margin will be the key imperative of PV, uh, of a CV. And of course, PV keep the show going and uh, accelerate as much as possible. So that's in a broad nutshell what we are working on. Happy to take any questions that you may have. I already see we have about 13 odd questions that have landed up already. Let me start. I think Girish, the first one is coming your way. Mm. Uh, this is from Sonal Gupta, LNT Mutual Fund. MNHCB market share is not down to 54.6% in Q1. Is there a level at which you expect this to stabilize? And what are the risks that the commodity benefits are competed away in that CV business? Commodity benefits are given away in the CV business. Okay. So, so first of all, on, yeah, first of all, on the market share front, so uh, I think over the past, uh, Four years we have been consistently growing market share in MNSC. Uh, we've seen some softening happening in uh, Q1, but uh, we are determined to get this back. And on the back of various actions that we have, both on the demand generation front as well as launch of new products, I think we should be getting it back. So certainly not satisfied at this level. As far as the commodities are concerned, oh, sorry, Balaji. commodity margins are likely to be given away and due to intense competition. So. I think uh, we have a, a comprehensive margin improvement plan running, which is uh, working on both the planks. That is, how do we improve the realization basis, delivering more value to the customer? And the second thing is, how do we keep on shaving off cost? And uh, one of the cost benefits is, you know, the commodity reductions, which are likely to happen. So we see how it comes. And also, Sonal, just to add to that point, uh, if you recollect the outlook, we're specifically calling out and reach double digit debit uh, EBITDA the earlier. So that's a clearly an imperative for this business. Okay, next slide. Uh, next question uh, from Janesh Gandhi on to JLR. Uh, Adrian, I think this is coming your way. How should we think about mix for JLR considering ramp up and range over range over sport defender, but also chip supply is expected to improve? Should mix further deteriorate over first quarter levels? And the second question, do you expect strong and consistent increase in both sales from second quarter? From the 90k level, the base signal. And lastly, in which line item does an effect revaluation and unrealized commodity hedges get perspective? Three questions. Okay, thanks, Balaji. So, you know, the mix was really weak in quarter one. Uh, Range Rover mix was about 8% of that 70,000 units. Our order bank is telling us that between Range Rover and Range Rover Sport, it's 40% of the order bank there. So, there's a significant uh, 
improvement of mix that will happen once we start to overcome that, those issues we've referenced significantly in the uh, quarterly results so far. So I absolutely anticipate mix not only to improve in quarter two, but to continue improving through the balance of the year as those production challenges continue to reduce. Uh, do I expect strong and consistent increase in wholesale from Q2? Look, I expect each quarter to be better than the quarter before. That's no different actually to what I've been saying for the last two to three quarters. I did expect that in this quarter also actually. So if I had to pull a number on the data last uh, in uh, in March, that number would have been 70,000 high rather than 70,000 mid, and the difference would have all been Range Rovers, and that would have actually started to shape the quarter much closer to the level of uh, EBIT stroke uh, cash loss I was inferring on May the 13th. So I do expect each quarter to be better than the last. I can see the data for the first three weeks. We're now building consistently above 7,000 units a week, and we're building consistently week on week on week. That will increase to the 8,000 units plus, which we will need in this quarter when we start building Range Rover Sports. We haven't built Range Rover Sports for six to seven weeks apart from a few units just in proof and try it. That will begin to happen post shutdown from the uh, 8th of August. So we're pretty confident actually with what we see in front of us that the build will grow from seven to 8,000 units a week. We have 11 production weeks in the quarter that gets you close to the 90,000 units and we have 10,000 units in WIP, which will reduce. And therefore that's why we're saying we think the wholesale number will be 90,000 units. And which line item does FX uh, revaluation? Well, it appears down the whole stub. So it's significant on revenue, of course, as we bring all of the overseas revenues into sterling. It's significant on cost, of course, because so much of our cost base is sourced in overseas currencies, around 55% a lot in euros, but it's line by line. So if you take marketing costs, if you take marketing costs, then within the marketing costs, which is obviously in the other expenses, we add up all of the foreign currency pieces. And then we have a big line item in there, which really covers you know, our exchange losses. So it's down the whole stub. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Yep. Uh, next question also from Vinay Gandhi. Uh, so it's really coming your way. Uh, what's our capacity and capacity in the PRG? What are the scope to increase capacity to be bottling? So, you know, we are uh, pretty much operating at uh, uh, full capacity in Ranjangao and Pune. We have some headroom in uh, as far as uh, the salmon plant is concerned. Uh, to further you know, debottling our capacity, there are actions in plan, and we see a additional possibility of 10 to 15 percent further debottling again. So that's as far as the capacity plan is concerned. As, as you know, we are further working on uh, the food. That's it. Thanks, Shalish. Girish Yawe, are you seeing sustenance of demand from small fleet operators? Yeah, so uh, you know, few things I would like to say. First is the sentiment index that we measure is is at a high, and um, therefore that is an indication of the interest from both large as well as small fleet operators. Also, if you see the intermediate and light commercial vehicles as well as, as, well as small commercial vehicles, generally the small or retail customers, single vehicle owners are the buyers for these vehicles. And these uh, these segments have grown more than that of MNSV. So actually, the small fleet owners, single vehicle owners, are still are in the market and uh, not likely to see softening uh, immediately. The point on inflation, which I'll pick up, Dinesh, uh, they expect commodity savings to come in second quarter. We do see commodities starting to pull off, and uh, you should start seeing this coming from second half as the uh, current hedges wear off, as well as some of the contracts we are putting in place start coming too. So let's see how it plays out. Uh, next question is from Ronak Sagar Systematics. Uh, any specific headwinds on CV EBITDA margin as QI, Q1 FY23 production was largely similar to Q4, uh, coupled with softening RF? Yeah, so 
I think two points I would like to make. So one is, um, of course, the scale impact. So the revenue has actually gone down by 15% from Q4 to Q1. So that is one of the reasons. Second is that the MNSTV volumes have come down by more than 20% from Q4 to Q1. So this uh, uh, certainly has an impact on on the on the control on the margins. But what I would like to say is, on the back of the pricing and the cost reduction actions that we've taken, the fundamental contribution or underlying contribution margin has actually improved over uh, Q4 of the last year. Thanks, Ah, thank you, uh, thank you Girish. Um, Next question is to me actually uh, on India eBus order wins. Can you please take us through how the GCP order win will be accounted in the financial? Okay, there are two things here. One is the Tata Motors standalone, and then there's the subsidiary Tata Motors uh, Smart Mobility Solutions Limited. So there will be first be a sale happening from Tata Motors to Tata Motors standalone uh, to the Smart Mobility Solution. This will be construed as a sale in the in the uh, standalone books. But in the consolidated books, this will cancel each other out, so the revenue will not be recognized. There, number one. <laughs> number two, this asset continues to remain in the smart mobility solution books, and we will have, and the collection will happen over a period of time as this bus starts running, and therefore there will be a revenue recognition happening on the as the as, uh, in terms of rupees per kilometer, in terms of the number of kilometers that it traverses, and that will be the smart mobility solution books. Against which the running cost, operating cost, etc., will be set off against. Over a period of time, once this particular, so obviously the next question that comes is you'll keep building assets in your books. The answer is yes. And over a period of time, once the collection history has been established, then you'll be able to take this asset off your books. You'll be able to sell down these assets. There are multiple options out there. And there are also other conversations that are happening, happening, happening with the government. Find a way to actually refence this at, at the inception itself. And those you should start seeing some uh, results of those deliberations in the coming year, and definitely before the next tender that comes out of this size. But but there's a, there's a lot of possibilities to how to actually lighten the balance sheet and reduce the collection risk and the solvency risk of the issues. Okay, next question is from Pratik Koda, uh, Nippon India MC. JNR has called out a production of close to 90k units. Uh, is it fair to say that the visibility of build rate as guided in people is very high? Uh, Pratik, uh, Adrian has covered this elaborately, therefore I wouldn't want to repeat this. Uh, if yes, can you highlight some of the reasons for the same which is already done so? Um, and on the India PV division, looks like the model cycle tailwind for us is over. Uh, although model refresh can be a lever. Is there a concern within the team that the market share loss might be a possibility going forward? Unless we start with a new model cycle. Yeah, so I think uh, you are well aware of the intensifying uh, competitive landscape country. And uh, sustaining our share, I think we have two, three points here to share. One that, as you rightly mentioned, that uh, the cycle plan or the MCs and uh, refreshes uh, is a cycle that we will see in the next two to three years, starting next year. And that should uh, not only help us sustain, but slightly grow our market share. Uh, also, right now, the share level at which we are, let's go the headroom because we are still our supplies are less than the demand. The second uh, major lever for us would be uh, the power points. We have a unique position. We have a unique position where we have all the four power points, petrol, diesel, CNG, as well as electric. And uh, therefore, we are at the sweet spot of the boot that we are going to see the next uh, few years. As far as CNG is in electric is concerned, so that should give us with the current models and with the expansion that we are going to see in the EV and CNG space as far as electrification and uh, bringing more CNG models, uh, we will witness a growth in this segment because of our unique position of having multi power option. And uh, third is, of course, we have to add unique weights. Uh, there are certain gaps in our portfolio which we are going to fill uh, in the coming years. Uh, one of them we have already shown to you, which is the concept curve, which we had uh, revealed in April. This is going to come while it is going to come with the first as an EV, but it is also going to come with uh, the base power planes also. And there will be additional link to it, which we will announce at the right time. So, mix of all these actions is going to ensure that we continue to grow our market position. Thanks, Jarej. Next question also, your way. Uh, what's your backup plan in case hybrids become a success in the India PV market? 
So as a company, see, we are closely, we'll be closely watching uh, how uh, adoption of hybrid takes place. But see, one thing we are very clear that uh, the long term uh, the drivers of the auto industry, as well as the governmental regulation and the issues that we have, uh, as far as auto industry is concerned, this is us the environmental issues. EV is the long term. And therefore, as a company, we are going to remain focused on EVs. Having said that, uh, you know, in the later part of this decade, as the emission norms are going to become more stringent, there will be a degree of electrification that would require in the current ice vehicles. And uh, therefore, as an organization, we will keep ourselves. There's also a question on pricing. Uh, can we launch EVs at prices similar to hybrids or a slight premium so that the value proposition of EVs and further improve vis a vis hybrid. Any thoughts? I have no clue of the hybrid prices, frankly, because we are going to now see two hybrid, strong hybrid dancing so far. There have been two, you know, mild hybrids or even lesser than mild hybrids. But we'll see how the pricing pans out. Uh, but uh, as, as you have already seen, that we have launched our meetings, which are 20 to 25 percent um, price, which is at premium to the current petrol and diesel model, automatic model. So it's already very competitive. I'm sure that this pricing would be contrary to a hybrid option that is going to come in the market. But let's see, you know, the pricing when it gets announced in this case. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Hitesh Goel, CLSA. How much is your steel contracts pricing in Q1 higher than spot price? And if you pick the steel cost at spot prices, should the margin be higher? Hitesh, you want to take that? Yeah. So generally, our uh, steel contracts. <coughs> are for a period of six months, but due to the recent volatility, we shifted to three months. So we are we have been doing uh, steel contracts on a quarterly basis. And I can tell you that the spot prices are may much more volatile and generally higher than the contracts that we have uh, with the steel money. Thank you. Uh, next question, JLR, uh, Adrian, coming your way. Is it possible, uh, Adrian, to sum up what was the margin pressure in Q1 that was one-off in nature? Can you already talk about? Sorry, Balaji, carry on. Uh, carry on, uh, Adrian. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, look, we we pointed towards this. It was particular around the Range Rover and Range Rover Sport facility. We only built and wholesaled 6,000 Range Rovers in the quarter. That's a significant diluting impact in the margin. I won't give you the data, but you know, your modeling should mostly point towards that data. So is it one off in nature? Well, the binary impact of very low production on Range Rover and almost zero production on Range Rover Sport is absolutely you know, minor impact to quarter one, which will progressively improve. So the margins will increase as well. Um, carry on. Yeah. yeah, the next question, I will skip the other one. The second one is on production, which you already covered extensively. Let's go to the one on hedges. Uh, when does the adverse impact of hedges start affecting operational numbers? Yeah, well, it's already up, uh, affecting the operational numbers, Balaji. I think if you went back to our, yep. to our, uh, walk uh, our EBIT walk and our profitability walk you know I think it would have said that the operational ex exchange was 210 and the impact of those hedges was about 115 versus previous year if I give you the rates actually you know the effective rate in Q1 was about 128 our hedges is in place going forward just over 130 so on a quarter by quarter basis we have got edges around the 130 going forward, but it's not too dissimilar to the effective rate in Q1. Okay. okay. The next question is from Raghunandan NK Global. Uh, for India business, can you please indicate commodity impact in Q1? I've already called out more than the commodity impact. Look at the thing between pricing versus uh, realization. Sorry, uh, realization versus variable cost. And you do see about a 30, 40 looks still to be recovered, but we believe this will come off as we go forward. Uh, as far as the e-buses, the company has won large orders. What kind of equity infusion is planned in the company that will own the e-buses as supplies over a gross contract basis? Uh, obviously, this will pan out over a period of time because the buses have to be delivered by till FY24, uh, 24 onward. So there is a fair amount of uh, time in front of us and we'll do it on a sequential basis. 
and it'll have to be a lot of things through the equity and debt combination to get that right as well. So leave it with us at an appropriate time. We share with you. This will not complicate the uh, calculations on getting net debt free. So you can uh, press PC on that, but we we'll still have to crack the fact that uh, this is asset heavy and there's a lot of work underway to get that back. Uh, uh, Girish, coming your way. Uh, yeah. How do you see the MHCV industry outlook for this year? Right. So I and think the share of CNG vehicles. Yes. So let me take the first one on MHCV. So I think this this would be the fourth quarter when uh, we've seen successive uh, growth that has happened in MHCV. This is happening on the back of uh, upfront uh, infrastructure spending by the government using freight, freight rates, fleet utilization. So I think most of the things seem to be falling in place. As I mentioned in the presentation, I think we are keeping a watch on two monitorables. One is the fuel prices and second is the interest rates and see what kind of impact it will have. But as of now, I think uh, it appears that we will see double digit growth in MNS series for the entire year. As far as CNG vehicles are concerned, I think over the past three months, the competitiveness of CNG price has, has gone down significantly with respect to diesel, although the gap still remains. But as a result, we've seen that the CNG salience, which used to be around 40% in our ILCV portfolio, has already come down to around 25 to 27%. So this is something we will also keep a watch on how the relative pricing between diesel and CNG plays out. I think as a company, we are ready for switching the portfolio either between diesel and uh, CNG and ensure that we, we ride the one which is required in the market. Thank you, Girish. Uh, Adrian, this is coming your way. A slightly different question on the production point. Uh, has there been any change in booking or the calculation from the way? At JLR as production rate of other players are rising ahead of us, or particularly this quarter when you had a challenge. Uh, and then the next question I think you have covered is on why the data inventory at JLR been rising for the last two quarters despite no real dip in order backlog. And any impact on the incremental demand due to the global economic growth concern. Yeah, okay, Balaji, let me take the first one. Um, look, when you when you study those order banks, I think a couple of things are quite evident. The three nameplates, the newest product, um, including including the Defender, of course, you know, the orders for those three nameplates just keep growing, just keep growing. And there's several reasons for that. I mean, we're not building as many as 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 we need to, of course, that's one piece of that. Um, but there aren't many on the road either. And that means we anticipate that the orders for these three nameplates, particularly Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, will continue to grow. And the risk of cancellation on those nameplates is very, very low. I think there is a disparity when you look at the other nameplates we have. The orders for those other nameplates, if you notice that data stayed pretty flat over the last nine to 12 months, around 70,000 units in total. Um, we haven't built to the level we can build there. So I think it's pretty pretty clear that once we can build all of the Range Rovers, Range Rover Sport, Defenders, Velars, Evokes, then you know once we go to a normal level of production, we will need to stimulate demand in some of these other nameplates, the lower transacting value nameplates, the SUV, two and SUV, three sectors, and also Jaguar sedans as well. But we are we are we are months away from that. We feel any cancellations we're getting are more in those lower value transacting nameplates, and there may be a link to question three, which is there, which is a subset and a part of that. But that's unclear for us because it isn't that substantial yet. Um, I think your question two about why is dealer inventory been growing? Just think of our um, global profile. As we build more Range Rovers and Range Rover Sports, and we have been, and I mentioned earlier about the slide, if you can visualize the slide about where do we actually sell those. We sell those mostly in, you know, markets which are far away, China, US of A. And of course, we own that inventory until that inventory is passed through ports of, uh, 
of, of entrance into those markets. So, you know, from dispatch from plants here in the UK, right through to the point of receipt in Shanghai, receipt in West, West, East and West US of A, that's on our inventory. So it's actually evidence that those cars are on the way. That's why it's growing and it will continue to grow beyond this point when we get back to a normalized level, perhaps another five or six thousand units. So it's actually a healthy sign, even though it may not look it when you read the cold data. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. Next question is from Pramod Kumar UBS. Uh, Adrian, this is coming away again. Can you indicate the transaction price for the new Range Rover versus the old Range Rover, given the significant upgrade to the model? Uh, no, I can't. Um, look, you know, I think this real data will show itself in two to three quarters time. You know, we, we're only built 6,000 cars. We've got 67,000 orders, 80 odd thousand across the two almost 90,000 orders. It'd be a great, it, it will be a great question when we get to Q4, but at this point in time, early orders, the most, the richest value orders are the most complex and the most difficult to build. So they're some of the ones which are still sat in their work in progress. Any data I give you will be misleading, but it's going to be bigger, right? You know it's going to be bigger. Those transacting prices are going to be bigger and they're going to be moving with close to zero VME. So they're going to be a really rich, healthy part of our portfolio going forward. Got it. Uh, we've talked about the macros, so I would skip that. Uh, question coming your way, uh, Shailesh, uh, order and Girish, uh, order <laughs> backlog for India PV and CV segments. Yeah, so CV uh, I wouldn't add, it's uh, yeah. there's no order backlog there, but PV is a more relevant one. Yes, so we have a very strong uh, order book, as I mentioned in my presentation also. And it ranges, you know, on an average, it's uh, about uh, two and a half to three months of uh, the average sales that we are doing right now. Uh, as far as uh, the various models are concerned for PV ice, it varies anywhere between four weeks to three months. For EVs, it is higher, especially for the Nexon EV Max. Uh, the average waiting period would be seven months and upwards. Okay, the next question is from Kapil Singh Nomura. Uh, we've talked about recession risk. Uh, do we have order books demand? We've covered it. India PVCD uh, commodity we've talked about. Uh, I think uh, same with Gunjan. I think you've talked about all the points that she has raised uh, in that uh, CSL funding, model share, power trend mix. I think we've talked about everything. Just put on. Uh, Uh, question from Satyam Thakur, credit Suisse. Uh, given luxury, global luxury OEMs, including JLR, have seen GP per vehicle rise significantly over the last six quarters. Do you expect to use any benign commodity environment to incrementally boost unit profitability, or do you see industry using lower cost environment ahead to help support demand amidst a global growth concern? Here, I think this is probably right up your alley. GP per vehicle, make sure I understand. The gross profit per vehicle, given the contribution margins have gone up. Uh, with lower commodity costs coming in and more profits coming your way, do you expect to take it to the bottom line or do you expect to stimulate the market? Well, um, what we can see at the moment is that in our segments, um, the, uh, the the offer, the supply is not at the right level compared to the demand. That's the first element that people need to, to, to understand. So there is, uh, uh, we can see as far as we are concerned that the demand continues to increase uh, despite we are increasing the pricing and 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 uh, just because uh, there is a scarcity in the market and because of the desirability of our our products are uh, such that there is a kind of magic happening here demand increase and pricing increase at the same time because it's clear that our profitability per car is also increasing and we we do more than compensating the inflationary uh, impacts that we can see as well Thank you. Thanks, Yuri. Uh, I think we're probably arriving at the last question. This is from Preranjan, HGFC AMC. Um, Shale, this is, a, this is your question. Does it make sense for the company to think of an ICE variant of curve when the entire taxation structure gives us too much leeway to price the vehicle within 500 kilometers range with a, at a similar price point? Absolutely, it makes sense. That's the reason why we are making both ICE fillers or uh, EV. Uh, I think there's, there's still going to be uh, a significant difference between the EV as well as ICE because here the attempt is to keep 
the premium that we have been keeping on the EV versus IS to increase the range, you know, as uh, we are able to take the benefit of taxation, as you rightly mentioned, uh, at the same time, uh, take the benefit of any battery price reduction, which might happen right now. We are seeing a slight spike in short term as it keeps on going down by the time we launch. We expect that uh, we will be able to deliver better range as compared to what the current EVs are. So therefore, it makes sense uh, at different price points, you figure demand uh, for different customer segments. And of course, you know, there will be customers who have, who are very, you know, uh, touchy about certain uh, power trains. So I think we would, we would like to give all the options to our customers. Thank you, Shailesh. And with that, uh, we come to the end of the Q&A session. Um, I think first, once again, thanks for your time. All of you are uh, really appreciated and also the probing questions. As we started off, uh, we do end this quarter on a disappointing note, but on a, at the same time, a very clear plan of action and a pathway in front of us in terms of how to deliver the rest of the year in a very strong way. And uh, therefore, quite committed to the numbers and the targets that we put ourselves and also deliver for our own potential. Thank you and see you in the next quarter in better times.